In the previous video, we discussed the construction of a brushed DC motor. There's a little bit of an art and magic to that because you're winding very thin wires very carefully around a rotor and then shoving it inside of a tube that has big magnets on it. Um, and depending on how much you pay for that motor, uh, you might get a motor that can go very fast or produces a lot of torque or uh, is very efficient. Let's not worry about the construction of the motor because they all will obey the same motor equation. Let's try to derive that. So we've got electrical power that goes into our motor and then out of the motor comes mechanical work. Um, so we can always start with um, some kind of power equation that the power that goes into our motor must be equal to the power that comes out. So we, we get this from thermodynamics. So what's the power that goes into our motor? Um, it's the uh, current that we put in times the voltage that we're putting across the motor. So uh, amps times volts is watts. So what power do we get out when the motor moves? Um, well, we're going to get the mechanical power uh, that we could describe as the torque that it produces times the angular velocity that it rotates. And I think in an ideal world, that would be it. But unfortunately, our motor is made of wire. Uh, and wire, uh, especially when it gets very thin so that we can get many loops through it, it's going to have a certain resistance. And when we put current through a wire, it's going to heat up with uh, Ohm's law. So we have to rem remember that some of the electrical power is also going to just get turned into heat due to the fact that we're putting current into a lot of wire. And the amount of heat that's dissipated is I squared R. So some of the electrical power gets turned into mechanical power and some uh, gets turned into heat. Uh, where else could it be going? Well, we're charging up this electromagnetic field um, by putting current into a coil. So some of the energy that we're putting in is also making this magnetic field and then that dissipates and then we're making it and breaking it. So we also have to remember that due to the fact that um, the coil is an inductor, we have the energy in um, a coil, L, I, D, I, D, T. Hopefully that's small compared to the mechanical work because we don't want to be just making a magnetic field and then letting it go away again. Um, and then what else is happening? Uh, if you just turn on your motor, what else do you see? It might not be balanced correctly, so it might be um, uh, vibrating inside of its bearings. Um, it's rotating inside those bearings, so there's got to be some kind of friction problem. Um, if you ever have a power drill and you turn it on in the dark, you'll see that it flashes a lot because the um, brushes are making and breaking contact with the commutator. Uh, the current is a high current going through an inductor. The, the current through the inductor can't change instantaneously. Um, so when the commutator makes and breaks contact um, with the brushes, we get sparks. Um, so we're also uh, putting energy into uh, light and sound and friction and a host of other things that are actually hard to model. So this is our a model of how our motor works. And sometimes we get really nice equations that are well known, I squared R, uh, L, I, D, I, D, T. The equation for friction, uh, much harder to say because there's um, friction when you're not moving. It's different from the kinetic friction, uh, how much power is going to sound and light. Hard to say. So um, this is our generic motor equation. We're going to take some simplifications and we're going to say, Let's just hope those are very, very small compared to the rest of these. Uh, now, of course, friction is probably the biggest one. Um, the textbook describes a little bit of modeling on how you could do a bit better job on friction. But let's let's throw that out for now. Uh, now, typically, when we look at this equation, uh, we divide each side by um, I. So we would get uh, V equals uh, tau over V omega plus I R plus L di dt. So this is another version of the motor equation. And oops, sorry, not <laughs> D over I. Thought that looked weird for a second. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we can um, pull out a few constants from this. So one is by saying we will define this factor, tau over i, as the torque constant for the motor. So kt is going to be equal to tau over i, or 
tau is equal to kt times i. So this coefficient here, um, which we'll replace with um, uh, kt, that's related to how well the motor is wound compared to how strong the magnetic field is uh, and a host of um, kind of the art of designing and manufacturing a brush DC motor. But you can think of KT as kind of a quality. The higher the KT, the more torque you get for a given amount of current. So you would prefer to buy a motor, I think, with a higher KT. Um, something else that we could do. Um, we can, okay, so let's, let's formalize the, the final version of our motor equation. So uh, that means that V is equal to uh, KT omega plus IR plus L di dt. So this is typically thought of as the motor equation derived from our power in versus power out. Um, okay, we're going to do a bunch of things with this equation. We're going to draw some um, plots and uh, describe how fast the motor can go and the maximum torque and things like that. Um, first, let's, uh, let's do something else. Um, Oftentimes this uh, L D I D T term um, is confounding. So let's see if we can get rid of it. How do we get rid of it? Well, if, if the current is not changing anymore, if we're at steady state, D I D T will be zero. So oftentimes we'll say at uh, S F, so at steady state, um, this boils down to uh, V equals K T omega plus I R. Okay, so we're basically getting rid of the inductance term by saying that let's, uh, not be um, accelerating or decelerating. Let's just pretend we're at uh, constant current. We've been running the motor for a long time. It's hit a steady state. It's no longer accelerating or decelerating. Um, so we can throw away the uh, di dt term. Um, another thing about the motor um, is that we can reverse it. So if we grab the shaft of the motor and spin it, it'll create a voltage on the output. So the brush DC motor is also a generator. So we apply voltage to the motor, creates current uh, that uh, goes through the motor. That means the motor has torque that makes it accelerate and you get speed. We do the opposite. We apply a torque to the motor that makes it start to rotate that will push current out and make a voltage. Uh, so let's uh, leave the motor open. So we'll make an assumption of uh, open circuit. Um, if we do uh, an open circuit, then I has to be zero. So this is uh, just a motor that we're going to spin, and we're just going to read the voltage across the terminals, uh, say, with the multimeter. So then we get uh, V equals KT omega. Um, so uh, KT will tell us the amount of torque we get from the motor, um, uh, given an amount of current that we put in. And it will also tell us what's the voltage across the motor if we were to spin its input shaft. Um, this is typically called the back EMF or back electromotive force. Uh, that's essentially the generator equation for the motor. Okay, so let's take uh, the equation at steady state. So we're gonna work with uh, this equation here. And let's try to draw a big graph. Um, and we will look at the speed of the motor, the angular speed, versus the torque that the motor produces. Um, so um, when um, the, we apply a um, voltage to the motor, we can get the, fa the fastest possible speed by using KT. So that is distinguished as omega naught, or the no load speed. So if we apply a voltage to the motor, um, when it's not moving, it will initially have as much current as it can possibly have. Uh, as it starts to spin, back EMF is generated. So if we apply, say, 6 volts to the motor, uh, when the motor's not moving, we will have the largest amount of current. Uh, that is called stall. As the motor begins to accelerate, uh, the back EMF will start to subtract off the voltage that we're applying to the motor until the motor gets its maximum speed. And so it will linearly go up, that should, should be a line, <laughs> um, to the no load speed. 
um, anything below this line is possible at this specific voltage. So this is a line of a specific voltage. Uh, this would be this, the torque at stall. Um, the torque is uh, related to uh, the current by KTI. Draw it up here so you can see it. Torque equals KTI. Um, so when we look at this uh, torque axis, it's essentially the same thing as, as looking at the current. So when you first apply a voltage to the motor, the motor is not spinning, so there's no back EMF. Um, so this part of the equation is zero. So we just get V equals IR, and we can calculate the stall current if we know the resistance of the motor. So knowing KT and the resistance of um, the motor and the voltage we apply, uh, we can figure out what the stall torque is. The motor begins to accelerate until eventually um, all of the voltage that we apply is canceled out by the back EMF. Um, and there, at the no load speed, there is no current going through the motor. Now, in reality, um, there's always a little bit of friction in the motor. Um, so here's the, like, the torque of the minimum amount of friction. So we never really get to the no load speed. We get close to it. We, we probably always measure this as a no load speed. Um, because there's a little bit of friction in the motor that it takes to um, overcome the friction in the bearings. Okay, so when you're at this point, if when you're at the stall point, how much um, mechanical power is the motor producing? Well, the mechanical power is the uh, torque times the speed, but at this point the speed is zero. So here we get zero power, and when the motor is going at its maximum speed, um, the torque is zero. So we also get no power. So the maximum amount of power you get out of the motor is when you're at half of the stall torque and half of the no load speed. So uh, P mechanical max is equal to one quarter of the no load speed times the stall torque. Um, what we'll be doing in the future is we'll be looking at the data sheet for these motors um, and we'll see that uh, sometimes they'll give us, say, stall torque, and sometimes they'll give us KT, and sometimes they'll give us uh, the mechanical power, uh, and then we have to backwards derive some of these other numbers. So the data sheet for the motor doesn't always give us all the information we want. It usually gives us enough that lets us figure out all the rest of the parameters. Um, okay, what else do we have? Um, an important aspect to the motor is that Regardless of where we are on this line, when we apply a voltage to the motor and it has a certain load on it that's make, that, that makes it spin at, say, a certain speed and we provide a certain torque and it just lives uh, right there on that line, um, there's a certain amount of current that's going through the motor at that point. And that current is making heat based on the I squared R uh, perimeter of the motor. Now, you know that if you take a 100 ohm resistor and you put 10 volts across it, uh, it's going to get a certain amount of amps and that will heat it up. And if the wattage, the rated wattage of that resistor isn't high enough, that resistor will eventually smoke and catch on fire and burn out. Any electrical component will do that if you go above its power rating. So the motor must have a heat-based power rating where you shouldn't go over that amount of dissipated heat because at some point the wires that are inside will get so hot that the insulation will melt off and then the wires will touch each other in short and then the motor will uh, behave as a motor anymore. So there's also a uh, P uh, motor... Um, that's usually just given as the, uh, the wattage of the motor, um, but I'll put heat here to specify specifically. And that'll be based on data sheet. And it's a little confusing because sometimes they give you the power for the motor, but what they really mean is the max mechanical power. Uh, but what we're specifically looking for is a destructive test of the motor that told you the maximum amount of power that the motor rotor can dissipate before it melts. Uh, that's also equal to I squared R. So if we knew the resistance of the motor and we were given the power rating of the motor, we could back calculate the max uh, current. So we would get a I max continuous. What does that mean? If we sit at this current for I squared R equals the power rating of the motor, or if we go above it, that means that the motor will be generating more heat than it can dissipate, and eventually the thermal runaway will make the motor melt. 
So if we uh, find R uh, on the data sheet or by reading it, and we're told the heat of the motor, we can't really calculate that. You usually have to destroy a motor by actually running it to its max and seeing what it melts. So the data sheet should tell you that. You can calculate I max continuous, which will, by using KT, will give you a max continuous uh, torque. And it's usually like way over here. <laughs> Um, uh, but it depends on the motor. So this would be uh, torque uh, max uh, continuous. Meaning that if we put more current into the motor, we can get access to all of these torques over here. But if we stayed there forever, eventually the motor would melt. But if we live over here in this uh, trapezoid, um, the motor is spinning so fast that it's cooling itself um, and that heat is dissipated away before the motor can melt. So you're allowed to, uh, say, uh, uh, live here and then go down here for, you know, depending on how far you go over here, you might only be able to live there for half a second. If you go over here, you might be able to live there for a couple minutes before you come back here and let yourself cool down. So it's, the motor is capable of providing everything under this line, um, but the safe zone is all over here. And if you were to, say, get more voltage, um, use a bigger battery, then that line goes up and is still a line over here. So by increasing the voltage, you increase your range. And if you didn't want to live on this line, if you wanted to live right in here, well, you could use PWM to uh, effectively apply less of a voltage to the motor um, and live anywhere under the curve. I want to show you some uh, motor spec sheets. See if I could bring that up. We have a bunch of sources that we could buy motors from. And depending on the source, um, you can sometimes get a nice data sheet and sometimes not get such a great data sheet. So, uh, here's an example motor. So going to Janeco, which is um, a nice electronics vendor for basic op amps and transistors and things like that. Uh, here's a, a, one of the motors that they sell. It's a 12 volt brush uh, DC motor, and they're saying it's 10,000 RPM. Um, we don't really know what that means. So 12 volts, uh, that's pretty obvious. They want you to run at 12 volts. Uh, is this the no load speed? Is this a, a max power speed? Hard to know. Um, but there's, they have almost a thousand of them. They're around four dollars each. Uh, we can look at these rough specs. It's a uh, twelve volts, but you could go twelve to eighteen. The current and max efficiency is five point eight volts. Okay, so um, we could also calculate an efficiency curve for this motor, and it's going to lie somewhere between yeah. zero and the stall torque. So um, I don't know why they're telling us the max efficiency motor instead of the current instead of the stall current or something like that. It's also giving us the max efficiency RPM. Okay, we'd have to back calculate from these two. The rest of the parameters we're interested in gives us the torque. Uh, I guess the torque and the current here can tell us what KT is. Uh, and then some sizing of the motor. Um, but that's kind of like the sales pitch. There's also a PDF available for the data sheet. Let's take a look at that. Um, so this motor is a Japanese motor. So the uh, uh, spec sheet is half in Japanese but generally pretty readable. What do we see? Um, this is a rated for 12 volts. So if you, you can obviously run a motor any voltage. We could run this motor at 48 volts. That's four times the rated amounts. So that probably means that um, the brushes are going to wear faster, um, that all the testing that they've done has always been at 12 volts. Uh, and then we can always go lower. Um, the rated load, uh, half a kilogram centimeter. Uh, this style motor, uh, looks a lot like the kind you would find in a cordless drill. So if you're thinking of size and, and what that looks like. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Uh, here's a no load current, uh, about one amp. Um, so that means that we could pry back out the uh, friction torque in this motor, uh, if we could find the rest of the parameters. The no load speed, 12,000 RPM. That's quite fast. Uh, the rate Rated load current, uh, 5.8 amps. Notice the amount that can change here. So every motor is wound slightly differently by this machine that made it. Um, so you might get a motor with more torque and, and you might get one with less. 
Uh, let's keep going. The mechanical parameters. The shaft is always kind of floating on its bearings. How much does it wiggle? Okay, here's some, some good stuff. So the locked rotor or the stall, uh, the RPM is going to be zero. So that's how we know this is a stall measurement. The stall current, 50 amps. That That's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's like a, a real lot. Uh, uh, the torque would be uh, four and a half kilogram centimeters. Um, for a you know a 12 volt motor, this is a lot of torque. Um, what else can we see here? Uh, the uh, power out 53 watts. Um, I would probably use this number, uh, the 50 watts, to estimate the. Uh, the max power that you could dissipate with this motor before it melts. So I would use this to get the max continuous torque. Um, but to do that, we'd have to know the resistance. And the resistance, we would need uh, V equals IR. So 12 volts and 50 ohms, uh, 50 amps would give us a number of ohms. And then we could use that to figure out the, uh, the maximum continuous torque. Okay, and then they give us a curve here, a bunch of different colors. Um, but you can see uh, our maximum speed at 12 volts is 12,000 RPM. Our, our maximum torque down here. We've got our power out. Here's the efficiency curve. I didn't derive that equation. It's in the textbook. Um, so they're saying you're, you're, you should be running this motor over here. And that probably means that the max continuous power is just to the right of it over here because they want you to be able to run at this efficiency without melting. So this is a pretty good data sheet. Uh, most $4 motors are not going to give you such a nice data sheet. Um, now, this motor is producing um, uh, almost five uh, kilogram centimeters at stall, but you can't really operate at stall because it would melt. Um, so normally you're going to be operating at much lower torques and crazy high speeds, 10,000 RPM. We won't really be able to use this motor without gears. The gears would reduce the speed and increase the torque. Um, and then we would very rarely be operating at stall, so maybe the current that we'd be going on this motor would be like 0 to 10 amps, not 0 to 50. Because you'll find it's actually quite difficult to find a both a power supply or a battery that could produce 50 <laughs> amps, uh, and also a driver like a transistor or an H-bridge that could supply that without melting itself as well. So this is a pretty high power motor. Um, Let's, let's look at some lower power motors. So when students come to me and say, I've got a specific application, uh, I need to drive a motor up a, uh, you know, a little robot up a hill. It's got uh, two inch diameter wheels and the uh, slope is a 10 degrees and it weighs a kilogram, something like that. Uh, when we can go to um, a website like this, uh, like Pololu and their uh, um, motor page that has a bunch of different sizes of motors with gears. And I would start the smallest one, a micro metal gear motor. This is uh, typically called an N20 motor. Um, and then we could go to a larger motor and larger as, as we need more and more um, power. And when you go uh, to this page, um, they also have data sheets, but they kind of rank them with just a few parameters. So we could look at a 12 volt motor and a six volt motor, and they have what they call low power motors, medium power, high power, um, and then uh, kind of more expensive as you get better brushes. And they're rated, the, all the motors are the same motor, so they all have the same stall current. And um, uh, each of these categories, I think, is a different motor base. So all of these uh, motors in the 12 volt high power carbon brush area, those are all the same motor. And then here are different um, gear ratios. And then this is a different motor, six volt motor with 1.5 amp uh, stall current. And we could see that with no um, or here we've got a five to one gear ratio. Um, it will go, the output shaft after the gears uh, is going uh, 6,800 RPM. So times five, this is like 30,000 RPM motor um, divided by five with a gearbox. And the torque you're getting is 1.3 ounce inches. And then as you add more and more gears, um, you get more and more torque. And of course, uh, less and less speed proportionally. Um, and then you could click on one of these to see the more specs and the price. Um, we get some, some current information. So when you look at the stall, you'd say, okay, I need a driver that can uh, supply at least 0.75 amps. 
and a battery that can produce at least 7.5 amps at 12 volts. Um, so that could probably be done with, well, eight double A's. That'd be a lot of double A's, but uh, pretty easy to produce this. Uh, this would go uh, 200 RPM if there were no load. So as you add load, of course, it would slow down. Um, and uh, it's got a 150 to one uh, gearbox. So there's a fair number of gears here. You can also see the shape of the output shaft is a D. Um, so that's how you could attach your wheel or whatever you need to rotate. Um, we could see a picture of the brushes that are on the inside, the little springs that they're on. This kind of looks like a bushing instead of a bearing. And then uh, the ability to add some kind of encoder on the back to sense the uh, position or velocity of the motor. So that's typically how we would go about uh, sourcing motors. First, you need to know um, the rough speed and torque that you will be operating in. So that might tell you I need this much speed and this much torque here. And when you find a motor, it would tell you, okay, the motor can operate in this range, but I need to be up here. So I better find a motor that has uh, a, a curve more like this or a curve more like this, or I could take this current motor and I could just increase the voltage to get to that point. Pay attention to the max continuous torque because if you need to operate here all the time, uh, this particular motor is going to melt. You need to find a motor that can dissipate more heat before it melts. And there's lots of other parameters um, that we could talk about, the inductance of the motor, uh, it's rotational inertia, uh, it's electrical time constant. There's lots of things that uh, go into choosing the right motor, but the main ones are thinking about speed, torque, and this curve.